Hi, and welcome to Extra Serving, a Nation's Restaurant News Podcast. I'm your host, Holly Petrie. Today on the pod, we're going to be talking about Starbucks' new CEO, the new California Fast Food Workers Bill, and our Hot Concepts Award. On Takeaway with Sam Okus, Sam spoke with the owners of Via 313, a Detroit-style pizza place, an interview you'll get to hear later on on the pod. Be sure to subscribe to Takeaway wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to check out First Bite, our daily morning podcast where I dissect the top news of the day alongside an NRN editor. And now it's time to introduce my co-hosts. I am Sam Okus, Editor-in-Chief of Nation's Restaurant News. And I'm Leanne Zinsmeister, Managing Editor of Nation's Restaurant News. No corrections this week? Believe it or not, you actually got everything right. So I'm I'm flabbergasted. Well, time for everything. Flabbergasted. <laughs> a big word. Thank you. It's a big word for you. I like to try on a few big words for size every so often. <laughs> okay. So, right. so let's talk about some of the news. Let's get right into it. No chit chat this week. We're just going to news it up. we got a lot to discuss. No chit chat. That doesn't sound like us. That's going to say. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Who are we? We can find chit chat in between. Mm -hmm. Who are we? <laughs> Well, Sam, are you drinking my orange, orange juice? juice? I sure am. Yeah, I wish I could say it was a mimosa, but it is actually just orange juice. You ever have that? You it's ever so have crazy. that moment in time where you crave something but you don't know what? I'm going to take that no? as a no. So I have these moments <laughs> where I'm just like, I want to either eat something or drink something, but I have no other information other than I would like to eat or drink something. And I wasn't very hungry because I had had breakfast, but a couple of hours ago and it wasn't quite lunchtime. So I said to myself, well, let's consume something healthy. So to see if I satisfy my desire to eat something or drink something. And sure enough, this glass of orange juice did the trick. So there you go. Orange juice does your so body good. See, I feel as though we should have just gone right into the news instead of that Is story. <laughs> There are going to be people out there listening to this who are, are who are nodding vigorously right now. Yes, I too sometimes crave something and I don't know what. Uh, I think that's just general hunger. No, I wasn't hungry. Like I think you're just I had hungry. a big breakfast and so I wasn't hungry. I was just like my mouth my mouth needs something yummy. It needs like and something usually that when that when usually when I get that it's chocolate. That's when and like I need something sweet. <laughs> So in this case, I didn't want to have chocolate at 11 a.m., so I got orange juice instead. And, and you're drinking out of a mug, which makes it even more interesting. I would have had the 11 a.m. chocolate, but okay. Yeah. Yeah, fun little mug. Uh, well, anyway, I feel like I've made everybody a lot smarter already, so. It's a big leap. Everybody? Well, okay, well, let's talk we about this new Starbucks CEO. I'm cracking down. You know who has orange juice on their menu? I think bad Starbucks segue. Does, right? Bad segue. Very bad segue. <laughs> Says the queen of bad segues. Anyway, yes, let's talk about Starbucks' new CEO. Yes, so Starbucks finally got its new CEO. Uh, and we are, I was surprised to hear that they announced it before Investor Day, personally. Um, I didn't think they were going to announce it so soon. Uh, I was shocked. I was on vacation and I got the notification. And every year when I'm on vacation, some CEO always leaves uh, or starts a new job. It's always like CEO Palooza whenever I go on vacation. Um, so I always love to see it. Uh, <laughs> I'm always like, I should have known. Uh, but so Starbucks got a new CEO and he's starting in officially in April um, without Howard Schultz behind him, but he starts with Howard Schultz in October. So what do you guys think about this new CEO and what he's going to do for the job? Well, I'm trying to decide if we need you to travel more or less. I mean, it's good for us to have new CEOs from the sake of our business model and sharing the news, perhaps not good for the CEOs themselves. So beware when Holly travels. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess a couple of things, um, just right off the bat, I apologize if I don't pronounce his name correctly. Um, Laxman Narasimhan. Is, I haven't heard it said out loud yet, so, yet. so um, I will probably be corrected. I think the whole industry has been carefully avoiding. Yeah, that. and um, <laughs> anyway, so so my apologies to- No one wants to go first. We will all figure that out together soon, I'm sure. Um, 
he has a great resume. I mean, PepsiCo is the big thing off his resume that is a, an obvious parallel to Starbucks. Um, and he was also with uh, McKinsey, um, which is obviously a, a giant um, organization where many, many well-renowned leaders come out of. Um, and so I think, you know, first off, let's just say he's not a company man. And that's probably what Starbucks needs now. That's where a lot of companies, I think, start to trip over themselves is they hire company men over and over and over again, emphasis on men, uh, but particularly from the company. Um, and, you know, if you've been with a company for 30 years, sure, you've risen the ladder, you're in a position to, you know, the organization inside and out, but you're also going to be probably void of outside the box ideas. You're going to be way too entrenched in what we've already done and what hasn't worked and not be able to really think outside the box, think of some creative solutions. That's where bringing somebody in from outside the organization is really helpful. Um, that was something that McDonald's um, did with um, Chris, uh, also not going to pronounce his name correctly. Uh, we got to get some John Smiths and Sally Smiths up in here with the CEOs. Anyway, um, and, and that's worked out really well for, for McDonald's, obviously. So, um, so that, I think this is, um, I mean, on, this, on, on paper, a good move. Uh, outside person, incredible resume and leadership um, with some adjacent industries. And hopefully he's going to be able to come in and think a little bit more creatively about how to position Starbucks mm -hmm. in the coming years. And they, I think they desperately need that in this, in this time that they've been going through. Yeah, I agree. I'm curious to see to what extent he's going to be like a Howard Schultz 2.0, um, which I believe is what Howard Schultz was looking for. Um, and of course, he'll stay on the job for six months um, working side by side. Um, but I'm really especially curious about what will happen like next spring and summer once Howard Schultz steps away. Um, and he just said, like, yesterday or today, like, I'm definitely not going to be CEO of Starbucks again, which, you know. Every, everybody's saying. wondering. But, <laughs> everybody is wondering. Yeah. As we were on the edge of our seat, we, <laughs> that. we definitely believe you. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what will happen long term, um, if he'll kind of follow the blueprint that's been laid out for him or if he'll make some different and surprising moves. But I agree that it's great to have a a fresh perspective on board there. And for him, I think makes a lot of sense too, as a career move. He was most recently CEO of a company called wreck -It. So this is, you know, still a CEO move, obviously much bigger company, much higher profile. Uh, so we'll see. I was also surprised that it was announced at this point. I really thought we would get um, an announcement <clears throat> at investor day or sometime in October. I so. have to imagine this is strategic, right? The timing is, is, it, it sort of feels like a, hey, everybody, look over here. <laughs> um, we a, Absolutely. As we have talked about uh, often on this podcast, um, Starbucks is really going through it right now, just from on all fronts. Um, and, you know, they needed, they needed some news that people could support. They needed news that shareholders could get behind, right? And maybe this, this strate strategy of um, you know, throwing it out there ahead of investor day can, can build some momentum leading into investor day where maybe they have some more announcements to make. Um, yeah. And so, but, but we've known a new star, a Starbucks CEO was coming for a, a year. I mean, it's been a, a long time now that we've known this was going to come and lots of speculation. I, I do think it's a little interesting that this person, uh, that they didn't select somebody from the restaurant industry. We had, we've speculated on some, uh, other industry CEOs who could have made sense. Uh, but again, maybe this is just, this is a big swing. This is a, a really outside the box um, hire and somebody to think a lot more um, strategically about Starbucks. Of note, um, to your point, Leanne, his his previous employer, Reckitt, what is a, a retail organization. Um, maybe we should look into that as a clue as to what Starbucks wants to do going forward. I don't know. Um but yeah, um, TBD on, on how this goes. And yeah, I mean, all of us are, are um, nobody will be surprised if Howard Schultz swoops back in at some point to deem this a, a failure uh, because it's just kind of a thing he does. But I do think for the sake of Starbucks, he probably needs to just let it go.
I do find that it really interesting. Take a deep breath. Yeah. <laughs> take a deep breath, Schultz. Take a deep breath. <laughs> like, take a vacation. It's okay. It's okay. Let go a little <laughs> bit. Ease off. <laughs> I do. That's my, that's my advice. <laughs> that's good advice. You know, he was looking for it. <laughs> he was like, what does Leanne Zinsmeister have to say? And now he knows. Yep. I was thinking, I wonder if, if um, this new CEO is going to bring Starbucks into more of like this retail focused world or if he's got, I mean, cause they're having all these issues with people. I wonder if like bringing him in was almost this way of focusing more on the retail side of things rather than the restaurant side of things was almost something I was curious about um, because I'm sure that he, it feels the same way about unions as Howard Schultz does. I'm sure that was a big defining factor about why he was chosen. I'm sure that that was a big thing for Schultz was how does he feel about unions? Um, so I'm sure that if that's going to continue in the same direction as far as Starbucks goes, but um, I'm curious to just see if it's going to push Starbucks into more of a retail direction than they already are. Or like, if it's going to push, I'm, I'm just very curious about that element, if, if that's going to have any impact. Well, to that point, I mean, I, I think if you just survey the um, dine out industry, let's call it, you know, food service, but just broadly, how consumers engage with their favorite food and beverage brands and consume food and beverages. Everything seems to be, I mean, right off the bat, you could just say like all the lines blurred. Uh, between um, service models and, um, you know, e-commerce is drastically changing everything. So you have this, um, you have this time where the real estate doesn't matter as much. I mean, Starbucks comes up in this environment where they were uh, on Main and Main in every city. They got the A-plus prime real estate. You know, they just like slammed every city with shops on every corner because real estate was important to get in front of the customer. Well, now real estate, physical real estate is less important to get in front of the customer because of um, digital tools, digital mobile ordering, e-commerce. And so I, I just think like when you, and on, on my last episode of takeaway from last week, uh, when I talked to Tiffany Fiedler, um, she brought this point up, which was that the e-commerce industry is like, you're, 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 you're having this thing where all the supermarkets are now looking at ghost kitchens because basically the retail companies are now seeing the power of um, uh, an operation like a ghost kitchen. And then you have, you know, of course, food service has already figured out how to leverage a ghost kitchen. And they've, they're figuring out the sort of e-commerce piece of this after the retail industry is. But all of it's kind of coming together into this, you know, this, this fact that a customer – will want a one-stop shop for the, all of their food, beverage, et cetera. They're going to, you just want to go to your phone, push a couple buttons and get whatever you want. And right now it's very fractured where you just have lots of different services all over the place. And that's going to start to come in together. It's going to really start to centralize. And I, I have no evidence of this from Starbucks. I'm just theorizing here based on his retail experience. I mean, maybe that's what Starbucks is banking on. Starbucks has already said they have issues with their real estate, right? They were closing down some of their restaurants and, you know, shutting down their, their, that whole restroom situation going on. And Howard Schultz was talking smack about the neighborhood, some of the neighborhoods they were in. Um, you know, uh, the unionization is playing out, obviously, in individual stores all around the country. You can decentralize all of that using e-commerce. So maybe that's their plan. Maybe that's the move here is say, okay, well, our battles we're facing are, are in the brick and mortar. So let's instead prioritize the digital sphere. Um, I don't know. That's just my theory and maybe why how this guy's going to come in and, and help them with that. Sure. It's an interesting theory. Thank you. And when it comes true, you heard it here first. <laughs> Sam will get pride and nothing else. I'm going to rub it in your guys' faces so hard. <laughs> oh, God. God. We're real scared of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about some other news that, you know, could actually impact Starbucks and its unionization efforts as well. Um, is this California fast food workers bill? Um, so it was yes. signed by uh, Governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, and it could impact businesses like Starbucks and it could impact their unionization because this bill is 
almost, I mean, we talked a little bit about it last week, but it was, it was unsigned as of then. Uh, it was signed on Labor Day, um, which is ironic um, or perfect I think, timing. I think, I think the word you're looking for was symbolic. I think it was intentional, <laughs> Holly. <laughs> it was symbolic. I don't think, I don't think he signed it and then went, oh, is it Labor Day? Uh, oh, <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, what do you guys think about this bill and its impacts on the industry? <laughs> Apparently to Holly, it felt like a coincidence. Um, yeah, it, you know, we, we kind of touched on this last week, but um, obviously, um, you know, let's just take this from a business case, obviously. Uh, from a business case, this is a um, not a – this is a pretty tough uh, regulation on, of the industry. And – um, I say from a business case, of course, of course um, depending where you fall on just, you know, political spectrum and, and government and, and all that, you know, people are going to have different attitudes about it. But just purely from the, the business side of things, this is is going to make it really hard for California restaurants. But it's also just a messy bill. I mean, you know, the fact that it's 100, uh, it, it affects restaurants with 100 locations or more nationally. I mean, that right off the bat is just kind of problematic because... Um, I mean, there's just so many restaurants with fewer than a hundred locations. And then, so, so, you know, you could say, well, that's just not fair. Why do you say, you know, that it should affect these and not those? I mean, you think about like an 80, 90 unit, uh, restaurant company is still hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. And it, so it feels like they're sort of sticking it to the major, um, QSR chains. Um, and, um, but also, of course, to in have this council that's going to increase minimum wage, um, it's just going to really uh, – it's, it's, it's obviously going to impact all of the uh, QSRs in California that are part of a brand that crosses that threshold, which is you know no fault of their own for a franchisee in California who just happens to be part of an organization with over 100 locations – you know, suddenly they have to, you know, meet these uh, wage requirements and these other um, labor requirements that can be significantly detrimental to their business. And, and so it actually can really hurt small businesses because you think especially about franchisees, this, that's talk about small business operators, right? Uh, but then also, you know, it's going to throw off things for even the uh, restaurants with less than 100 locations, because what if workers suddenly flock to all these other restaurants that are going to pay them $22 an hour and all these other ones are not paying that? It, 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 I just think, you know, and, and again, we talked about this last week, but it's like, I think we all agree that uh, employees should be paid more. Conditions should be improved. But I think that where this bill gets it so wrong is that is, is how to do those things. And then the way they've attempted to frame the bill, I just think is so um, I don't want to call it biased, but it, it is it is really favoring some over others in a, a very problematic way. Um, and, you know, I've seen some headlines that other states might follow suit. And I just don't think I don't know why any state would want to follow suit, because I think this is going to ultimately backfire on California. Um, look, no, nobody's weeping over California losing business, right? I mean, it's like the eighth largest economy in the world or something. I mean, it's, you know, it's not like there's going to be this migration of businesses out of California because of this, but this does really significantly impact anybody who would want to consider investing in California because of that regulatory environment. So, um, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of my thought there. I'm mostly eager to... Yeah, just to watch it play out. Um, I don't think it would surprise any of our listeners and certainly not the two of you to learn that I think this is a great bill, that I'm pro-worker and all that. But I agree with Sam that this specific bill is probably not going to fix anything in the long term overall for the industry. Um, so I'm eager to see who ends up on this council, which will supposedly be bipartisan and how they'll work together to set standards. Um, I'm not really seeing a way that that happens. Uh, so, you know, it'll be fun to watch, I guess, from that perspective. Uh, and like Sam said, just to see if this is something that could carry over in some form to states. <clears throat> I mean, especially, you know, the other particularly blue states. I'm thinking about New York, uh, which, of course, the city has some similar laws, but not the state. Uh, I Yeah, I think this is the 
beginnings of something, but I don't think this bill is actually like it as far as worker protections. Yeah, maybe that's a good point that this is maybe even their intention to make this big splash to get the ball rolling. And then if you, I mean, if you propose something here, uh, when we're here and you come out here, you're still, it's still a win, right? Like maybe, maybe that's the case. And it's funny you say that Leanne about, it'd be fun to watch. I'm like a reality TV show. That's what that council needs to be is a reality TV show. Maybe we should produce it. <laughs> um, because yeah, like, okay, who is this council going to pitch that? Yeah, I'm going to pitch it. Uh, hey, California, I have an idea. Um, <laughs> So, but, but like, <laughs> like who, who gets to be on that council? You're right. Like there's no way that ends up being a bipartisan council. And if it does end up being a bipartisan council, it will just be bickering until they just decide, let's get rid of this bill. Of course. Um, like, cause, cause how would anybody, um, on the right come onto that cancel council and say, sure, we'll give you these concessions. <laughs> They're not, that's not going to happen. Um, and, and, and then, and then, yeah, like, how do they come to any agreement? All of it just seems so odd. And so the, the messiness of this is, is what's, what's off here. Like, I, I really am supportive of um, raising the minimum wage. I think most people could sit, can t say outright, like, we should just raise the minimum wage. Um, but you have to do that for everybody. That, that's what the minimum wage is all about, is that it affects every business. That, that's right. the way to do this, rather than just sort of cherry picking the businesses that you're trying to influence w that does seem to be fairly biased. And so obviously the whole industry is in an uproar and I think rightfully so. And um, who knows, maybe, maybe that will impact who gets on the council and what kinds of things they put together, but it's just going to be a mess regardless. I was talking with uh, Joanna Fantosi for an episode of first fight uh, about this bill. And she was saying that one of the big concerns with the bill is that um, it's the fast food bill. It's not the QSR bill. It's not the fast casual bill. It's the fast food bill. And it hasn't been defined what is included in this bill. So they haven't defined the kind of restaurants that are included. So you don't really know who can or can't be on the council because fast food isn't really an industry term that, that we use. Um, it's, it's much broader than anything that we really use in the industry to define categories. And so um, she was saying that it's going to be really interesting to see how they decide to define these restaurants moving forward. And I found that really interesting to think about, you know, that like maybe In-N-Out won't be considered fast food or maybe it will, maybe Whataburger won't, maybe it will. Like, I'm just, I'm very curious to see what they decide where their cutoff is. Well, and you know, the, ter the term fast food, you it's almost being used in a derogatory sense, right? I mean, you know, it, it, the, fast food can be kind of this dirty word of, oh, it's just fast food, right? And and that's why so much of this bill feels a little bit biased because it feels like they're specifically taking aim at major QSR corporations um, and for it to be the fast food bill. Um, yeah, it, it just, it, there's just a lot he, at play here that feels probably personal to the industry. Um, I mean, it makes me think of some of the local ordinances that ban drive through in California. And it's like, you know, now, now, hey, there's some traffic traffic things that would would make a drive through problematic in a in a certain city, but on the whole, banning drive through is banning fast food. It's it's just it just feels like more than the actual like there's there's symbolism to the act that is more than simply banning drive through. And same thing is going on here, right? Which is like trying to punish an industry and um and and look, hey, not. The industry is not all saints, right? Of course, but it is made up primarily of small business owners. It is employing 15 million people nationally. It is the first stepping stone on the ladder, uh, workforce ladder for the vast majority of the pop well, majority of the population. Um, and so to to try to punish it is is just troubling. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. Lots of reasons. I'm not saying anything that's going to be, um, you know, surprising anybody who's listening to this right now. I'm sure everybody is kind of has the same thing. It, it, but if I could just round it out with a counterpoint, again, we do need to focus on worker conditions, better pay and culture. But if you can start that within your company and prove that it doesn't have to be regulatory and it doesn't have to be through union, do that just through your company and then you can avoid a lot of this.
Well, I think it's time to move on to happy news, which this week is talking about hot concepts. Woo. Happy news, happy news, happy news, happy news. That was today's song. They're all starting to kind of um, blur. They're kind of sounding alike. I, I would challenge you next week, Holly, to shake it up a little bit. Okay, will do. Great. Feedback noted. All right, so let's talk about hot concepts. Sam, why don't you tell us a little bit about Hot Concepts, what the award is, and a little bit about the companies we selected this year. I'd be happy to, Holly. Um, so uh, the Hot Concepts, of course, is our way of recognizing emerging restaurant brands around the country that we think have potential to become national success stories, household names. Um, we have various parameters for what that looks like, but uh, broadly speaking, these are concepts with fewer than 20 locations today um, that, again, we think really have a lot of uh, runway ahead of them to become major, major chains. So past hot concepts uh, have included Raising Cane's, Panda Express, Cheesecake Factory. So um, none of us were around for any of those as hot concepts, but um, we can go ahead and say good job uh, NRN teams of yore for getting it right. We hope to be doing uh, as equally good of a job uh, with the, the concepts we're picking these days. Um, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, that's, that's what we have um, the challenge for us to find those concepts. And it's a lot of just the coverage that we do, we, we do have a submission opportunity for brands, but then we also um, scour the country. We go back to all the reporting we've done. Uh, I think broadly speaking, our whole team, we all have kind of a gut check of who we know we we're talking about a lot. I am asked a lot about from people from the industry who, who's exciting today. So it's just something that's on my mind a lot. Um, so when it comes time to putting the list together, we typically have a few names that we think are going to be big. So this year's uh, honorees, we have four concepts on the on the list this year, and you can read more about them over at NRN.com. But the four are uh, Plant Burger, uh, which we've done some coverage of lately, uh, the concept from Chef Spike Mendelson, a uh, plant-based burger concept that's really grown with the help of Whole Foods. Uh, they have 12 locations on the East Coast today. Uh, Project Pollo, another plant-based concept. This one's out of San Antonio. They have 15 locations in Texas at the moment with plans to go much bigger than that. Um, 60 Vines, a casual concept um, from FB Society, which, as I understand it, now has a record four concepts that have graced the hot concept list. Uh, FB Society, former front burner brands. Um, and so this is their fourth concept on the list. Um, congratulations to them because they clearly know what they're doing. Uh, 60 Vines is kind of this um, wine bar, casual Napa wine country um concept um, that has a handful of locations, but I think is offering this experience that people increasingly want today. Uh, and then our fourth concept on the list is Home State, which is a Tex-Mex concept out of Los Angeles. Um, it has five locations and um, Brianna Valdez, the the founder, she's a Texas native who really wanted to bring her um, the, the flavors of her upbringing to Los Angeles where she had relocated and it just does that in a really um, high quality way. So um, all four of these will be on hand at Create uh, here in 10 days, oh my goodness, in 10 days in Denver. Uh, and they will give their stories and talk about the challenges they're facing today, their their path to success, um, their growth trajectory, um, um, all of that. So if you're coming to create, you'll have a chance to meet with those folks firsthand. But yes, this is our stamp of approval on these four concepts as we think being future household names. Very exciting. It is happy news. It is very happy news. Such this is my favorite part of the job. I yeah. always... Yeah, I was going to say, I always come away from this time of year with like a list of new restaurants yep. to try. You know, when I travel, I try to hit up these concepts. Several of these are in Dallas, which I'll be visiting in a couple of weeks. So fun to have new places to try. And it's also fun to visit some of the established restaurants that were hot concepts in the past and see how excited they still get about it. I was at Raising Cane's headquarters in the spring and they gave like a 30 minute quick hit overview of their company and spent probably five minutes talking about NRN and their hot concept award and how exciting that was for them 20 years ago. So it's a big deal. I mean, you know, it, look, we're, 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 we'll be modest about it, but like, I think, you know, it to be recognized by a, a, a national publication is, is a big deal for folks. Um, and that's why it's my favorite part of the job. It's just like, you get to recognize, um, you know, entrepreneurs, often founders of these companies that have put have put in blood, sweat, and tears 
um, over several years to build a business that was probably their dream for a long time before it became a reality and to get to a point where you can be acknowledged mm -hmm. as being like, yeah, you are, you are set apart. You are, um, you are, are a cut above and we think you've got big things ahead of you. Like, that's a cool thing to do. And of course, like we like to think this, this does put them on the map. It helps to say to investors and other operators, potential franchisees, like if you're looking for, if you're looking for something, you know, we think that these, these are safe bets. That was so sweet. I almost brought a tear to my eye, the way you described, uh, hot concepts. That was so well, sweet. Must've been the orange juice. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, Sam, you actually did this week's interview. It's it's a snippet from Takeaway, your podcast. So why don't you That's tell right. us about who you interviewed this week and tell us a little, bit about, a little bit about your podcast. Sure. So, yeah, we talk about it every week here. Um, but for those who have not listened to Takeaway, um, it is my weekly podcast where I interview um, uh, restaurant influencers is how I call them. So it might be CEOs of companies, but often it's also just founders of emerging companies. Kind of going back to what I was just talking about, you know, I, I have long had a passion for um, recognizing upcoming brands that are um, just doing things differently and, and have an interesting story to tell. And so that's a lot of the voices that we get into takeaway. We do have the CEOs of major companies, but then we lots of um, folks who have been around five, 10 years, um, you know, again, entrepreneurial, um, typically founders of the business or, or leading a, a young business. And, um, and so that was the case for this week's episode, which is uh, Brandon and Zane Hunt. Uh, they co-founded together um, uh, via 313 Pizzeria. They're, they are from Detroit. This is a Detroit-style pizza concept, but it's based in Austin. They moved to Austin um, about 10 years ago and started this company. Uh, they recently got an investment from Savory Fund, which I know we've talked about a lot here. Uh, another organization that is um, recognizing uh, startup brands that are really exciting, um, only with a lot more money than we have. <laughs> so uh, there's that element. But Savory um, invested in Via 313 two years ago, and um, they've now expanded to 10 locations. I was just at one last week. Um, so I was out at Savory Fund's Restaurantology event in Salt Lake City, and there was a, um, a dinner at the Via 313 in Lehigh, Utah, and that I was at, and um, uh, it was my second Via 313 experience, but their pizza is just so doggone good. Um, Detroit-style pizza, but it's a full-service concept. We're not talking takeout delivery joint. Um, it's really a high-quality um, kind of place. And so they walked me through their story, talked about the challenges of the business, the ups and downs, the success stories. Um, and so, yeah, that's this week's episode of takeaway, which you can hear here, here now. Um, but if you like what you hear, go subscribe to takeaway and you can get the full archive. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I bet people will subscribe to takeaway because that was a wonderful description. Thanks Holly. <laughs> Good pitch. <laughs> <laughs>